everything we need to know about fluid uh, therapy. Welcome again in uh, Amsterdam. These are my disclosures. They haven't changed from my previous lecture. And this talk will also be about breaking some bad habits. I like the number four. And I will present you the four questions, the four indications, the four phases and the four Ds of fluid therapy. So let's start with the four Ds. It's easy to remember four. Fluids are drugs, so they are like any medication. They come with indications and contraindications, adverse events, maximum and toxic doses, equally important. And there are different doses for resuscitation. You can have a 4 ml per kilo in 15 minutes. And for maintenance, you can have 1 ml um, per kilo per hour. The duration is important. Whenever the patient is able to take fluids by himself, orally, or by a nasogastric tube, we should stop unnecessary IV fluids. And maybe also, when we are giving fluids, we must ask ourselves, is there a possibility to come down with the amount of fluid, so de-escalation. So you remember those drug duration de-escalation is what we refer to as antibiotic stewardship. And we're all very well familiar with that. Next to the four Ds come the four questions. Because there are only four indications or four questions that we need to take in mind when we're giving fluids. So the first one, when do I need to start giving IV fluids? Because the best fluid may be the one that has not been given unnecessary. I told you that you and you and you, you're all fluid responsive, yet you don't have an IV fluid bag. After giving fluids, at some point, we need to stop fluids. When the patient is stable, hemodynamics are normalized, micro and micro hemodynamics are restored. And some patients will accumulate fluid. I know there's been a discussion by Jean-Louis Vincent and Pinsky on the term fluid overload, because it's confusing. Is it hyperhydration? Is it hypervolemia? Where is the fluid in the intravascular, extravascular, interstitial, intracellular space? We don't know, so there is a lot of confusion. But some patients may need de-resuscitation. Of course, when you're taking off fluid, we must avoid hypervolemia and tissue hyperperfusion. Next come four indications. We can give fluids for resuscitation. And we agree that resuscitation fluids should save lives, not kill patients. We have fluids for maintenance, and maintenance fluids should cover the daily needs. As Robert Hahn nicely told, the daily needs for water, sodium, potassium, glucose. And that's why in Belgium, and after the studies of Niels looking at hypotonic versus isotonic solutions as maintenance, he found out that hypotonic solutions are better and end with a less positive cumulative fluid balance. So that's why in Belgium you get hypotonic beer with the salt making the beer isotonic, which makes you pee less, more thirsty and drink more. So it's a win-win for the bartender. <laughs> Replacement fluids should mimic the fluid that is lost. And here comes maybe the only indication for abnormal saline, which can lead to hyperchloremic metabolic acidosis, so you could give it when there are gastrointestinal losses. And the last indication for fluids is for nutrition. We have to provide fluid volume to give daily needs in calories. There are many slides on crisps and chips in relation to saline. This is one from Sean Backshaw, and he believes it's 50 little bags. There are other slides with three big bags, but you can pick one. So what does the literature tell us? And we've been hearing about studies this morning, like the vice study, Christmas, success, chest, a lot of confusion there. Then came the crystal study, the split trial. We've heard about the Albios trial, and then more confusion. And now recently, we had on the balanced crystallites, like the SALT ED, SALT ICU, and then we heard about the relief trial. So all this creates a lot of confusion. It's like also a reaction in the scientific community, and like a battle between good and bad, and it may become religious at some point. So the bottom line is that we should not give hypotonic solutions like glucose 5% for resuscitation, as only 10% 
will remain in the intravascular space. Crystalloids about 25. And colloids, I put the question mark there because there is a lot of debate. Maybe, maybe they stay in the intravascular compartment for 100%. So what practically, what fluids in surgery and trauma? Well, we mustn't do those, but maybe balanced blood, shelf time is important, and the fluid strategy. What about fluids in the ICU? So maybe it's the same. It's balanced blood, albumin, maybe, for the resuscitation later on. But I believe that the fluid strategy may be more important than the fluid itself. So the last four is the four phases of fluid therapy. And when it comes to sepsis, I agree that sepsis kills and sepsis and all the bundles and the guidelines mix science with politics in America. It's insurance companies, industry, money, and religion. So it is like a battle between good and evil. And I based this slide on Jolt Molnar's idea on the battle between good and bad, and damps and pamps, and colloids and crystalloids. But if you look at the three hour bundle, which has now been changed to a one hour bundle, well, we have to give 30 ml per kilo in one hour. Seriously? This is the SEP1 mandate in the state of New York. 30 ml per kilo in one hour? Isn't this a state of complete and utter madness? Why? Well, if you would be a patient in the States and you would have a weight of 155, so you need four 650 ml of fluid in one hour, if you don't do that and you live in the state of New York, then you go to court and you're sued for malpractice. But if you don't give it, then you also go to court, so you're screwed anyway. If you give it or you don't give it, either for fluid overload and, or for fluid underload. So if water is a problem, then maybe the resuscitation may be the solution. Which brings me to the four phases of fluid therapy. With the blossoming of the rose, we give fluids to resuscitate the patient, to optimize organ function, stabilize the patient, and then at some point we need to de-escalate and evacuate the excess of fluids. Many patients will have a polyuric phase, but some of them entering in a global increased permeability syndrome may need uh, some active removal. So the first hit, fluid balance, must be positive. The second hit is optimization, and the third hit is the polyuric phase and a fluid balance may become negative, of course, we must avoid a fourth hit, which is hypoperfusion. And hence, the analogy with the rose, and of course, this is just a dry rose, it's not a dead patient, of course. The problem is, if you look at these dynamic phases of fluid therapy in the literature, that we don't find a single study covering all the different phases, from initial resuscitation, to stabilization and to evacuation. So it's difficult to translate this to the bedside, and we must not forget that vasopressors may be or the first treatment to choose, because septic patients, initially, they are not hypovolemic, they are vasoplegic. So I guess it's time for fluid stewardship, and that's what we did in Brussels. So first, you check with your pharmacy, what are you using? And you can see that the top fluids were saline, and this is all together, so for maintenance, and for resuscitation. So we tested 119 doctors, 360 nurses. The score was 40%. So the knowledge about the glucose content in plasma light was 75% got it right. Sodium in saline, only half got it right. And how much do you give as a bolus? Only 25% got it right. So the average knowledge, 32% for the doctors. They are difficult questions, more difficult than the nurses, so we were nice for the nurses, and the score was 50% for the nurses. So in Brussels, we are sacked. But I believe you are sacked also. You could say this is fake news, and I don't believe it, and I just keep on treating fluids as I did before, but I think it's important to choose the right targets to administer fluids in order to reach the right goals. And the goal should be to avoid harm. The goal should be appropriate fluid therapy. And this is what we are now doing in Brussels with some posters, um, screen savers, and a fluid guideline with a plan, do, check, act cycle, as Marsha McDougall told us last year at this Fluid Academy. So to wrap things up, please go home and remember the four Ds, the four questions, the four indications, and the four phases. The four Ds, it's drug, it's dose, it's duration, and it's de-escalation. 
the four questions, it's when should I start, when should I stop, when should I start fluid removal, and when should I stop removal. And the four indications, resuscitation, maintenance, replacement, and nutrition. Don't forget the Rose concept, resuscitation, optimization, stabilization, evacuation. That's all I have to say. And I kindly invite you to join us in Brazil for a mini fluid academy next week. Thank you for your attention.